Man, if you're new here this morning, let me introduce myself. My name is Adam. I'm the pastor here. It's so good to have you if you're joining us for the first time. Man, my prayer for you today is this, that, man, you experience the power and the presence of God that is absolutely life-changing. If you can't tell, man, we are a passionate people for the presence of God. We are passionate about him and our worship, and we're just going after the fullness and everything that he has for us. Amen? Come on, church. If you do me a favor, if you are new, after service, come over here to Next Steps. We just want to get to know you, get some stuff in your hand, tell you more about Journey Church. Uh, last week, we, uh, we had Vision Sunday, Vision Sunday, and we felt like the Lord, I felt like the Lord gave me a word uh, back in September. And uh, it was this, it came from Psalm 137, by, uh, by his grace, that he multiplies them greatly. And I just believe that this next season here at Journey and in our lives personally is going to be a season of supernatural multiplication. It's going to happen through three different ways. So we're going to see supernatural multiplication through prayer, supernatural multiplication through missions going outside of these four walls, and supernatural multiplication as we invest in the next generation. And why is it supernatural? You might be saying, Adam, why not this multiplication? The reason why it's supernatural multiplication is because it literally has nothing to do with me. Yeah? It has nothing to do with you. Who is the one who brings supernatural multiplication? It is only Jesus. That's why it's supernatural. So we're believing this next year, we're going to see supernatural multiplication in our, in our lives personally and here corporately. I'm excited about really what the Lord is doing. I feel this, this stirring in my heart and this desperation, this desire in my heart just for more of the Lord. And it, it, it's not just one person or two people or three people. There's like this congregation, this group of believers is be, believing for incredible and mighty things. And it, this expectation in this room for uh, more of God has just been building and increasing. I just believe that the Lord really has more for us. How many believe that the Lord just has more for you personally? And that's really what this, this next series is, is really all about. We've li- kind of laid a foundation for this series as we're going on to this new series today. We've entitled Activate, and we're looking at the nine different gifts of the Spirit. And what we did last year is we went through the fruit of the Spirit which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And I I just believe this, church, that if we're not operating in the fruit of the Spirit, we really have no business operating in the gift of the Spirit that the Lord has given us. And so what we're going to do is we come before the Lord and we really just, what, what happens is as we operate in this gift, it comes through submissions. We submit ourselves to God that we're going to operate in these gifts with love, towards others, first and foremost. Not for our own glorification or anything else. It's just, Lord, I just, I just submit myself to you. Lord, I, I want all that you have for me, and I, I just want to press into you. And then from that place, I believe the Lord is going to activate the nine gifts within this body. What is it for? We're going to read here in a moment, but it's for the building up of his church. So let's go to the text right now that we're going to be looking at throughout this series it's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we're going to be exploring this, looking at this. Let's read together. Verse 4. Now, there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of ministry in the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of of the Spirit for what? For the common good, for everyone. Verse 8, for to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the, by the same Spirit, and to another gifts of healing by one Spirit, and to another the of, uh, effecting of miracles, and to another prophecy, and to another the distinguishing of spirits to another various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing them 
to each one individual just as he wills. So he gives an individual gift to each individual just as the Spirit of God wills. Verse 12, for just as the body is one and yet has many parts and all the parts of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free. And we were made, we were all made to drink of one spirit. For the body is not one part, but what? Many parts. Now let's go down to verse 28. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, and various kinds of tongues. All are not apostles, are they? He's asking these questions. All are not prophets, are they? All are not teachers, are they? All are not workers of miracles, are they? All do not have gifts of healing, do they? All do not speak with tongues, do they? All do not interpret, do they? But earnestly desire the greater gifts. And yet, I'm going to show you a far better way. So we'll be looking at this entire chapter throughout the next nine weeks. And really, when you really break it down, we could spend much longer than just nine weeks on this chapter. There is a lot there. But what I believe this morning is that the Lord is going to begin to activate these gifts in our lives. And the title of my message this morning is this, God, give me wisdom. God, give me wisdom. Would you pray with me? Holy Spirit, we are desperate, literally so desperate for you. God, there is nothing that we could do apart from you. Lord, I pray that God, that you would place in our heart a desire, God, just for you and only you and all that you have for us. God, we don't want to hold anything back. We say yes to your ways. We say yes to, our, to your will. We say yes to everything that you have, God. Just as Paul writes here, God, we earnestly desire, God, these gifts. But Lord, our first and foremost desire is you, the giver of every perfect gift. And so, Father, we just surrender everything to you. God, I pray that, God, you would make your Logos word alive in our hearts. You would make it rhema to us, Jesus. Lord, all that we want is you, Jesus. And so, Lord, we just say to you, speak to us this morning. Holy Spirit, speak to us this morning for your servants are listening. We're your servants, and we submit to you this morning. And everyone said, amen, amen, amen. Uh, there were things, wasn't there, 20 years ago that we would do that now society doesn't do today. Think about it. Uh, 20 years ago, there were landline telephones, and sure, you might have made a phone call, but when you actually began dating someone, you couldn't text them. You actually had to have a phone conversation with them. You know what I'm saying? It was a lot harder to get with that person you really like because you had to actually have a conversation and not just send them a text. Times have changed, haven't they? 20 years ago, it was unheard of even five years ago that you could work from home. Nowadays, it's a common practice that you can work from home. 20 years ago, man, when you went to go shopping for something, I don't know about you, but I don't go to the mall much anymore to go shopping. I'm going on Amazon. I'm shopping there. I don't like the crowds. I don't like the busyness of all that. And so Things have changed, times have changed, our thought process has changed. You know, growing up, my grandma would say this to me, Adam, do not, she would look at me straight in the eye when I was a young kid, do not get in the car with any strangers. Remember that conversation? Adam, do not get in the car with any strangers. Think about it. Nowadays, what do we do? We actually pay someone to take us somewhere, and we don't even know them. It's called Uber and Lyft. Society today has rethought some things. We've looked at things differently than what we did 20 years ago. And this is what I'm asking you to do in this series. I'm asking you to rethink 
these nine gifts of the Spirit. I'm asking you to look at this in a biblical way, not on what you may have experienced in the past, but let's look at the Word of God and what He says in the Word. Because I, I know many people in this room, you're right now, you're like, Adam, when I read these nine gifts, the, the, some of these gifts are really, really weird. I don't know about this stuff. I'm a little bit hesitant with it. Uh, and and m- m- what I kind of think about that is, you know, aren't we all just a little bit on the weird side? We are. Doesn't mean that we have to make it more weird by no means. But, it, but here's the second thing. I know many of you in this room, maybe not, maybe it's a clean slate for you. And that's amazing. The many of you in this room, you've seen some of these gifts being operated in, and it's hindered your walk with the Lord. Maybe for you personally, um, you felt like you were uh, hurt by these gifts being in operation because it was done in a way that was self-glorifying or done in a way that um, wasn't humble. And what I'm asking you to do is just rethink all this stuff, relook at this in a biblical way. Uh, but you know, I've experienced where I've seen these gifts operate in a way that uh, weren't healthy. And my goal really in this series is this, that we begin to rediscover, rethink these gifts, and we will operate in these gifts in a healthy way for what? For the building up of the body. There's a, uh, a saying that one of my mentors uh, has said, he's, he's, he says this, he says, uh, when referring to the nine gifts of the Spirit, that misuse and ab- abuse does not equal disuse. Misuse and abuse does not equal disuse. So what we're going to do is we're going to operate in these gifts with love, fully submitted to God, and allow Him just to move in our lives and our hearts. And let me encourage you with this right now. We read this earlier. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 31 says this. What? But earnestly desire the greater gifts, and yet I am going to show you a far better way. We are to earnestly desire the gifts. I don't know about you, but I want everything that God has for me. I want every part of what the Lord has. I'm not, I'm not seeking after the gifts. What I'm doing is I'm first setting my heart on God. I'm seeking after him first and allowing him just to do whatever, but I'm open and I'm fully surrendered to him and submitting to him. I'm going to operate in this in love. How many of you would just commit to yourself and say, I'm going to relook at these, these, these nine gifts. I'm going to rethink these nine gifts. I want to look at this in a biblical way. And what I want is I want everything that God has for me. If that is you, would you just raise your hand? Come on over this room. Lord, I just want to pray for us. Lord, right now, I pray that, God, that uh, man's opinion wouldn't be the narrative of this series. Man's thought processes or even my thought process wouldn't be the heart of it, Lord. But Lord, what we want and what we desire, Jesus, is just to operate in these nine gifts in a biblical way according to your, your, your word, Jesus. And what we just want to say to you this morning is just say yes to you. Yes to everything you have. God, we are going all in. Lord, we expect you, Jesus. We are, we are expecting, God, for you to move and to work in our lives, God. And so, Lord, We're not coming with skeptical hearts. We're coming with just hearts open, wanting to receive from you. We love you. In Jesus' name, everybody just say yes to God. Come on. Just say, come on, say yes to the Lord. We say yes to you, Jesus. So let's look at the gift that we are talking about today. This is found in verse uh, verse 8, and it says this. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. And to another, the word of knowledge according to the same spirit. Two things here that I want you to know. The first thing is this, is that the word of wisdom is very similar to the word of knowledge. They're 
Two things that are very similar, but yet they are different. I want to cover the differences of a word of wisdom and a word of knowledge in week four when we get to a word of knowledge, okay? So just remember that word of wisdom is similar, but also different from the word of knowledge. Number two thing that I want you to know is we must know that a spiritual word of wisdom is not the same as everyday wisdom. Yet, don't we need everyday wisdom in our life? Spiritual wisdom, a word of wisdom is not the same uh, as everyday wisdom. So let's first compare these two things. What's, what's everyday wisdom and what's a word of wisdom? The Bible calls Solomon the wisest man who ever lived. And he talks about natural, everyday wisdom. Ecclesiastes 10.10 says this. If the ax is dull and one does not sharpen the edge, then he must use more strength. But wisdom brings what? Wisdom brings success. The King James Version says it's profitable to direct. Have you ever met before or seen an athlete who was successful, who did not train on a regular basis to get to the level that they were in. I've never heard of an athlete get to the pros, where it's NFL, basketball, whatever it might be, without training, without working hard. You know, I had dreams as a young kid to be in the NBA one day. And I, I, I worked from the time I was seven years old to the time I was 16 years old. Literally every day after school, man, I would spend two, three hours practicing basketball and going after it. Unfortunately for me, though, I probably could have gone to a small college, but I wasn't quite tall enough. You know, I'm 6'1", but 6'1 still does not cut it if you're a two guard. Like, I, I, I could shoot threes. I was good at that. I worked at it. But like, again, I could have gone to a small college, but it wasn't in the cards for me, right? Uh, but, but in order to get good at something, what do you have to do? You have to work at it. You have to train at it. When I knew that I was called into to be a worship pastor, I actually received different prophetic words as a young kid, and, and it was something that really shaped my life. Uh, but what I did was I began to work at my craft when I started, when I turned 16 years old. I knew that the Lord was calling me one day to be a worship pastor. And so what did I do? I worked at my craft. I picked up the guitar. I learned it. I picked up the piano, started playing. And I learned it. Like I, I learned how to do it. When I knew the Lord was calling me to, to pastor, what did I do? I began to study. I began to read the word of God. I began to dive in like I never had before. Why? Because you can't just try hard to be successful, can you? What do you have to do? You have to, wisdom says you have to train. You have to work at it. You have to train to prepare yourself for what is ahead and what God has for you. So Ecclesiastes 10.10 is basically saying, you've got to sharpen the ax to cut down the tree. You can't just go with willpower and say, I'm going to try to cut down the tree without sharpening the ax. That's what Solomon was talking about here. And so we need to understand that there's a difference between a word of wisdom and everyday natural wisdom. But we need everyday natural wisdom in the times that we live, yes? Isn't there lacking in society today everyday natural wisdom? I mean, l l think about it for a moment. This, I don't mean this is a knock, so please don't take it that way. But doesn't it feel like People just feel so entitled to get what they want instead of training hard at it. They feel like they're called to do something, but then they don't want to put in the work. Yeah. And so they're like, hey, I really want to do this without the training, and they want the benefit without the hard work. Wisdom would say, hey, you have to put in the work and the effort to get where you want to go. We need everyday wisdom in the time in which we live. The cool thing about this is we can ask the Lord for everyday wisdom. If you're lacking something, if you need help in an area, the Lord will give you everyday natural wisdom, which we need. Look at this, James 1, 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach. This wisdom that he's talking about here is everyday natural wisdom. And it will be given to him. So if you're having difficulty in a job, you're having difficulty with a situation, whatever it might be, 
God can give you wisdom for you to be successful in whatever job, whatever situation that you're facing. Everyday natural wisdom. We all need more of it. What is now a word of wisdom? What is the spiritual wisdom that is found here in 1 Corinthians? Here's a definition I want to give you. Here's a word of wisdom. A word of wisdom is this. is a tiny portion of God's total wisdom directly and supernaturally imparted by the Holy Spirit. Let me read that again. A word of wisdom is a tiny portion of God's total wisdom directly and supernaturally imparted by the Holy Spirit. Back to 1 Corinthians 12, 8. For to one is given the word, say word. It's a word of wisdom through what? Through the Spirit. So God has what? He has all wisdom. He knows all. He sees all. He has all wisdom. And fortunately for you and for me, he does not give all of the wisdom in the world because what would happen? We would be completely and totally overwhelmed. So this gift is given by supernatural means because the result would not be available by natural means. It is imparted by the Holy Spirit in a way we could not get for ourselves. So Jesus, let's just look at this for a moment. Think about this. Jesus is the only person who walked out living uh, in these nine gifts fully and completely without mistake and without error. He was the only one who walked out fivefold ministry perfectly well. What is a fivefold ministry? He was a perfect pastor, prophet, evangelist, um, prophet, and teacher. Five, I want to mix them up there. Fivefold ministry. He walked those out perfectly. But he also walked out in those various um, places of ministry. Uh, in a perfect way through walking out these nine gifts of ministry, right? And so think about this. If Jesus was the only one who walked these out absolutely perfectly, then can't we realize and understand that we're not going to every single time walk whatever gift out that God has given us absolutely perfectly every single time? And so do we do. When we feel like we have a word of wisdom for someone, and God has given us a word of knowledge for someone or a prophetic word, what do we do? We submit it to them in a very humble way. You know, I, 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 I feel like, this is, this is just me personally, this is how I see it, I feel like it's dangerous to say, thus saith the Lord. Because there, there, there's, a, there's a human element that's built up in, in us as well. And so what's the, probably the most healthy way of approaching when we feel like we have a word from God? I would submit to you and say, it's this. Preface every statement you feel like God's speaking to you about a situation with, I feel like God is saying to you. I feel like, because what that does, it gives the other person the ability to say, okay, that's God or that's not God. Do you see how that's a lot more healthy? That, that's God, because what you can do with the prophetic is you can say, okay, I receive that word or I reject that word. And so we're submitting to the person in a very humble, in a very loving way, and we're allowing that person to discern, is that God or is it not God? Was that the tacos they ate the night before or is it the Holy Spirit? You understand what I'm saying? And so if you're going to walk in these gifts, which we should walk in these gifts that God has told you to do something, you should be able to boldly and lovingly operate in them, but, but do it in a way of submitting it to the person, allowing the person to hear from the Lord for themselves, right? And what happens on the receiving end of a, of a word from God is this. You can say, uh, Lord, I, I want confirmation from this. I shared last week how the Lord confirmed the vision for this, for this, for this year, Lord, I want confirmation. Lord, would you confirm it? Because what happens when you receive a word from God is I believe the Lord just gives you confirmation. 
He'll give you confirmation. He'll give you confirmation. And so you can know, is it, is it God or is it something else? And so as we're walking in these gifts, we need to do it with what? We need to do it with love. We need to do it humbly. And we need to do it with the other person's best interest in mind. But we also, church, with this, don't get me wrong, we have to walk in these gifts boldly. Don't back down. Don't be afraid. Walk in them boldly. Understanding, though, that, hey, people do make mistakes. And so what that does, though, is it gives us grace for the other person, doesn't it? If you're on the receiving end, it gives you grace for the other person if they're wrong. You're not thinking that person's a bad person just because they, they might have said something that you might felt like, hey, that's not God, right? You're not judging them for it. I mean, if anything, you're saying, hey, thank you for stepping out and sharing that with me. Is everybody okay with this? You all get what I'm saying? So our goal is to walk in these, in these nine gifts in a healthy, uh, loving way. What I just said is incredibly important. So let's dive in now to, um, let me also say this. When you're giving a word to someone, you have a word of wisdom over a situation, what I believe for me personally is, man, there's a weight that you feel along with it. Yeah, you feel this weight where it's like, wow, the Lord is speaking to me, and I've got to get this off my chest right now. I've got to say something. All right, so let's go into uh, th- uh, three things a word of wisdom, when used appropriately, will do. Three things a word of wisdom, when used appropriately, will do. Number one, a God-given word of wisdom can bring conviction. A God-given word of wisdom can bring conviction. Let's go to Luke 5, 4 through 10. It says this. When Jesus had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered him and said to him, Master, we have told all night and called nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. I love this. From now on, you will catch men. Now, this is an obvious supernatural encounter with Jesus. Think about it. Peter is a professional fisherman. He's been fishing all night. He's a pro, but yet he's caught nothing. Jesus, what is he? He's a carpenter. Even though he's Jesus, in the natural, he knows nothing about fishing. But through a word of wisdom given to Jesus, to Peter... What happens? Peter reluctantly goes and fishes on this side, even though he's like, Lord, I've already done it. And through this word of wisdom, Peter pulls up all this fish. It breaks the nets, fills up the entire boat. And the next thing you know, Peter is saying, Lord, I'm a sinner. Why does he come to that place of realizing that he's a sinner? It's because he realizes that Jesus, that God is all-knowing. You see, when a word of wisdom is done properly, what it does is it brings to the other person this knowledge of like, wow, God literally knows everything about me. You ever been there before? Where you've received something from someone, you're like, wow, God literally knows everything about me. And what it does is you come to a place where you're like, man, Lord, I love you, I fear you, I don't want to disappoint you. Lord, you literally know everything about me. Like, it's just crazy. My mom, growing up, she would tell me this. Literally, growing up as a teenager, she'd tell me this every single day. I encourage some of you parents to tell your teenagers the exact same thing. She'd tell me, Adam, I'm praying that your sins find you out. (laughs) I would leave, and my mom would say to me, Adam, I'm praying today that your sins will find you out, that I'll know everything that happens. And so I'm like, okay, mom. And the thing about my mom is she operated in gift of knowledge, gift of word of wisdom, like incredibly accurately. 
And she'd call me out on things that the Lord would tell her. So I'm 17 years old one night, and I have my first girlfriend. I've dated two people my entire life. Uh, Laura, my wife now, my beautiful, amazing wife, and, and someone else. Yep. I'm going to say someone else. And uh, I was 17. I was over at my girlfriend's house, and her parents were out of town, and it was midnight. Not good for a 17-year-old to be put in that situation, right? My mom literally calls me up at midnight, and she says to me, Adam, the Holy Spirit woke me up, and he told me that you're in trouble, and you need to get home right now. She, she had no idea that her parents were out of town. She goes, Adam, I trust you, but I know you're in trouble. You need to get your, your butt home right now. <laughs> and come to find out, she found out, and she goes, listen, Adam, I'm telling you, the, the Lord is going to tell me everything that happens. And sure enough, it felt, it felt like every time that I got into a precarious, uh, bad situation, that she would call me up. And it was this real, realization in my life as a young teenager that, man, God literally knows everything. And not only that, but God's a tattletale. He's going to tell my mom about it. And it put this fear of the Lord in me. Hey, parents, tell your teenagers that. And really legitimately pray that prayer. It can protect them. And because of that, I had this healthy fear of the Lord. I have this healthy knowledge, man, that, that God knows everything about me. He sees all. He sees my sin. He sees everything I've done. And man, I just want to walk the straight and narrow. I want to follow him. Because the realization of this knowledge of like, man, God is real. <laughs> like, how does my mom know all these things? So what does it do when you operating the gift of wisdom properly, it brings conviction to someone. I felt super convicted what the Lord was telling my mom. Number two, a God-given word of wisdom can solve problems and bring unity. Let me show you this example in Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. Now in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying... There arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. So the poor wasn't being taken care of, resulting in division among the people. Verse 2. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Watch this. Here's the word of wisdom given. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, Full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. So this, seeking out this, this people of wisdom, this is everyday earthly wisdom. Uh, it says this, whom we may appoint over the business. Verse 4. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. In the saying, please the whole multitude. So the first priority of the, of the apostles were to be in prayer and to preach the word of God. It wasn't that it wasn't important, but it was second priority to make sure that the poor was taken care of and that the needs of the people were distributed out properly. And so this word of wisdom came that, hey, we need to appoint seven people to take care of this so that the apostles could concentrate on preaching the word and in prayer. And this is what the people's response to this word of wisdom was. Verse 5, in the saying pleased the whole multitude. So this is another result of a word of wisdom. God's people, when you really see a word of wisdom operated properly, they say, man, that's it. That's God speaking right now. That agrees in my spirit. Now watch what happens uh, as a result here, practically speaking. Verse 7, then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. You see, this would not have happened if this word of wisdom wouldn't have gone forth, and this practical problem wasn't solved. Because there would have been continuing division, frustration, and jealousy among the people. And so although this was a practical problem, it also had important spiritual ramifications. And the solution here 
was God giving a word of wisdom to his people. This word of wisdom given by the Spirit solved a practical problem. So number one, a word of wisdom can bring conviction. Number two, it can solve problems and bring unity among people. And number three, a God-given word of wisdom can produce open doors and spiritual progress. A word of wisdom can produce open doors and spiritual progress. So during Paul's second missionary journey with Silas, he was looking at, hey, where do we go next to spread the gospel? During this first missionary journey with Barnabas, he saw um, they went on a, different, on, on a path, and the Lord kind of comes, and he's directing Paul and Silas towards different cities that had not been reached yet. Let's read this together, Acts 16, 6 through 10. It says this, Now when they had gone through Phry, Phry, Phrygia, can't pronounce that very well, in the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go to Bithynia by the Spirit, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. Watch this. And a man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over here to Macedonia and help us. Now after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, including that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Now watch this. Notice they had to be obedient to doors being closed, not once, but twice. The Spirit of God was leading and directing Paul and Silas, and it would have been much more convenient to follow through with their plan and go to these cities, these two other cities that were closer, but the Spirit of God closed those doors. And through a vision, a word of wisdom that came through a vision, they understood that they needed to go to Macedonia, which was much further away. And so what that did was it opened doors to where the gospel could be preached to Macedonia and they could hear the gospel for the first time ever. You see, a, a right word of wisdom when given with humility, when given with love, when given appropriately, it can open doors, it can close doors, it leads and directs the people of God. I don't know about you, maybe in your life right now, maybe you're in a certain situation and you're wondering what to do next. Maybe in your life currently you're needing the Lord to show you what to do. And the Lord wants to give you wisdom in leading you and directing you. That might come through natural wisdom. We all need more natural wisdom in our life. But that also could come through a word of wisdom. But this is my challenge to us during this entire series. Is again, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 31. Earnestly desire the gifts. Earnestly desire the gifts. Now think about this. When I give a gift to my kids, my kids are so extremely happy. Ruth's birthday is tomorrow. She's excited about the gifts she's about to open up. She's excited about the gifts that she's about to get. She's been talking about it for a couple days now. But I guarantee if you were to ask Ruth, Ruth, would you rather have your parents or would you rather have the gifts? All day long, she would rather have us. <laughs> there might be some days where she doesn't feel that way, but <laughs> all day she would rather have us as her father and a mother in her life. Listen, we need to be excited about these gifts. And there's nothing wrong with being excited about wanting these gifts. But above everything else, just like a child who much rather just have that love from a father, much rather just have a relationship with their mom, with their dad, we too 
here at Journey. Man, what I want more than anything else is first and foremost for us to have this relationship with God that runs deep and just say, Lord, I just want everything from you. But as a good father would do, he has good gifts for us. And we need to be excited about his gifts that he has for us. We need to be excited about what the Lord wants to do in our lives and how he wants to use us. To each one, he's given a different gift. Each one is different. Your gift is different than my gift, and my gift is different than your gift. And what this happens is we don't compare our gifts to one another, but we encourage one another, we love one another, and we boldly operate in these gifts with love. And we just say yes to whatever the Lord has. Would you rise with me? Prayer team, if you join me at the front.